Groupthink in a military context refers to the tendency within a cohesive military group or unit to prioritize consensus and conformity over critical analysis and independent thinking when making decisions. It occurs when the desire for unity and agreement within the group leads to flawed or ill-considered decisions, particularly in high-pressure or high-stakes situations. Groupthink in the military can have serious consequences including suboptimal strategic decisions, failure to identify and address risks, and ultimately compromised mission effectiveness. This concept underscores the importance of fostering an environment that encourages constructive dissent, diverse perspectives, and a willingness to challenge assumptions, especially during military planning and decision-making processes. Welcome aboard, Toland. Commander Strike Fleet Atlantic was a three-star billet, but Rear Admiral Scott Jacobson would have to settle for the job instead of the rank for the moment. The lifelong aviator was the most senior carrier division commander in the Navy, and was the replacement for the late Admiral Baker. You have one hell of a letter of introduction here from Admiral Beatty. He made too big a deal of it. All I did was pass along an idea somebody else came up with. Okay. You were on Nimitz when the task force got hit, right? Yes, sir. I was in CIC. The only other guy who got out was Sonny Svensson? Captain Svensson, yes, sir. Jacobson picked up his phone and punched three digits. Ask Captain Spaulding to join me. Thank you. Toland, you, me, and my operations officer are going to relive that experience. I want to see if there might be something our briefing left out. They're not going to punch any holes in my carrier, son. That's why I have you here. Your group got caught too far north for the circumstances. Taking Iceland was a beautiful move on their part. It screwed our plans pretty well. We are going to fix that, Commander. So I gather, sir. Ain't she pretty, O'Malley said. He flipped his cigarette over the side and crossed his arms, staring at the massive carrier on the horizon. She was just a dim gray shape with aircraft landing on the flat deck. My story is supposed to be about the convoy, Calloway sniffed. Well, they're making port right about now, end of story. The pilot turned with a wide grin. Hell, you made me famous, didn't you? You bloody aviators are all the same, the Reuters correspondent snapped angrily. The captain won't even tell me where we're going. You don't know? O'Malley asked in surprise. 
Well, where are we going? North! Toland stood in the combat information center, watching the displays. Submarines concerned him the most. Eight Allied subs were in the Denmark Strait, west of Iceland, forming a barrier that few submarines would be able to pass. They were supported by Navy Orions operating out of Sandrestrom, Greenland, something impossible until the Russian fighters at Keflavik had been whittled down. That closed off one possible avenue of access to strike fleet Atlantic. More submarines formed a line parallel to the fleet's line of advance, and those were supported by the carrier-borne S-3A Vikings that operated continuously off the flight decks. The Pentagon had leaked to the press that this marine division was en route to Germany, where the battle hung in the balance. In fact, the tight formation of amphibs was 20 miles from his carrier on a course of 039, 400 miles from its real objective. We're not heading north any longer, Calloway said. Dinner was being served in the wardroom. The officers were plowing through the last fresh lettuce aboard. I believe you're right, O'Malley agreed. I think we're heading west now. You might as well tell me what the devil we're up to. I've been shut off from your satellite transmitters. We're screening the Nimitz battle group, except that when you're motoring along at 25 knots, it's not all that easy. O'Malley didn't like this. They were running a risk. It was part of war, but the pilot didn't like any part of war, especially risks. They pay me to do it, not to like it. The escort is mostly British, isn't it? Yeah, so? That's a story I can use to tell the people at home how important. Now look, Mr. Calloway, let's say you file your story and it got published in the local papers. Then, let's say a Soviet agent reads the story and passes it along to... How would he do that? The government has undoubtedly put severe restrictions on all forms of communication. Ivan has lots of communication satellites, same as us. We have two satellite transmitters on this dinky little frigate. You've seen them. How expensive do they look? Think maybe you could have one in your backyard, inside a bush, maybe? Besides, the whole group is blacked out. Total MCON. Nobody is transmitting anything at the moment. Morris arrived and took his seat at the head of the table. The captain, where are we going? Calloway asked. I just found out. Sorry, I can't tell you. Battleaxe and we will continue to work together for a while as stern guard for the Nimitz group. We are now designated Mike Force. We getting any more help? O'Malley asked. Bunker Hill is heading this way. She had to reload her magazines and join up with HMS Illustrious. They'll operate in close when they catch up. We're going to outside picket again. We start doing real ASW work in another four hours. Still going to be a bastard trying to keep up with the carrier, though. Toland switched view graphs in the projector. Okay, these satellite shots are less than three hours old. Ivan has three mobile radars, here, here, and here. He moves them about daily, meaning that one's probably been moved already, and usually has two operating around the clock. At Keflavik, we have five SA-11 launch vehicles, four birds per vehicle. This Sam is very bad news. You've all been briefed on its known capabilities, and you'd better figure on a few hundred handheld SAMs, too. The photo shows six mobile anti-aircraft guns. We don't see any fixed ones. They're there, gentlemen. They're just camouflaged. At least five, perhaps as many as ten MiG-29 fighter interceptors. This used to be a regiment until the guys from Nimitz cut them down to size. 
Remember that the ones who are left are the ones who survived two squadrons of Tomcats. That is the opposition at Keflavik. Toland stepped aside while the wing operations officer went over the mission profile. It sounded impressive to Toland. He hoped it would be so for the Russians. The curtain went up 50 minutes later. The first aircraft launched for the strike were the E-2C Hawkeyes. Accompanied by fighters, they flew to within 80 miles of the Icelandic coast and radiated their own radar coverage all over the formation. More Hawkeyes reached farther out to cover the formation from possible air and submarine launched missile attack. Ground-based Soviet radar detected the Hawkeyes even before their powerful systems went active. They could see two of the slow propeller-driven aircraft hovering beyond SAM range, each accompanied by two other aircraft whose extended figure-eight course tracks denoted them as Tomcat interceptors guarding the Hawkeyes. The alarm was sounded. Fighter pilots boarded their aircraft while missile and gun crews raced to their stations. The fighter force commander was a major with three kills to his credit, but who had learned the virtue of caution the hard way. He'd been shot down once already. The Americans had sprung one trap on his regiment, and he had no wish to participate in a second. If this was an attack and not a feint to draw out what fighters remained on Iceland, how would he know? He reached his decision. On the major's command, the fighters lifted off, climbed to 20,000 feet, and orbited over the peninsula, conserving their fuel and remaining over land, where they could be supported by friendly SAMs. They had exercised carefully the previous few days with these tactics, and were as confident as they could be that the missile crews could distinguish between friendly and unfriendly aircraft. When they got to altitude, their radar threat receivers told them of more American Hawkeyes to the east and west. The information was relayed home with a request for a strike by the backfires. What they got back was a request to identify the American fleet's location and composition. The airbase commander didn't bother forwarding that. The Soviet fighter commander swore under his breath. The American radar aircraft were prime targets and tantalizingly within reach. With a full regiment, he'd streak after them and risk losses from their fighter escorts but he was sure that that was precisely what the Americans were hoping he'd do. The intruders went in first, skimming above the wave tops from the south at 500 knots, standard arm missiles hanging from their wings. More Tomcat fighters were behind them at high altitude. When the fighters passed the radar aircraft, they illuminated the circling MiGs with their radars and began to fire off Phoenix missiles. The MiGs couldn't ignore them. The Soviet fighters separated into two plane elements and scattered, coached from their ground-based radar controllers. The intruders popped up at a range of 30 miles, just outside the range of the SAMs, and loosed four standard arm missiles each, which homed in on the Russian search radars. The Russian radar operators faced a cruel choice. They could leave their search radars on and almost certainly have them destroyed, or turn them off and lessen the chance and completely lose track of the overhead air battle. They chose a middle ground. The Soviet SAM commander ordered his men to flip their systems on and off at random intervals, hoping to confuse the incoming missiles while keeping tenuous coverage of the incoming strike. The missile flight time was just over a minute and most of the radar crews took the time to switch their systems off and leave them off each misunderstanding the order in the most advantageous manner. The Phoenixes arrived first. The MiG pilots suddenly lost their ground control guidance but kept maneuvering. One aircraft had four missiles targeted and evaded two missiles only to blunder into another one. The Major in command swore at his inability to hit back as he tried to think of something that would work. Next came the standard arms. The Russians had three air search radars and three more for missile acquisition. All had been turned on when the first alarm sounded. Then, all had gone black after the missiles had been detected in the air. 
the standards were only partially confused. Their guidance systems had been designed to record the position of a radar in case it did go off the air. And they homed in on those positions now. The missiles killed two transmitters entirely and damaged two others. The American mission commander was annoyed. The Russian fighters were not cooperating. They hadn't come out even when the intruders had popped up. He'd had more fighters waiting low for that eventuality. But the Soviet radars were down. He gave the next order. Three squadrons of F-A-18 Hornets streaked in low from the north. The Russian air defense commander ordered his radars back on, saw that no more missiles were in the air, and soon picked up the low-flying Hornets. The MiG commander saw the American attack aircraft next, and with them, his chance. The MiG-29 was a virtual twin to the new American aircraft. The Hornets sought out the Russian SAM launchers and began to launch their guided missiles at them. Missiles crisscrossed the sky. Two Hornets fell to missiles, two more to guns, as the American fighter bombers scoured the ground with bombs and gunfire. Then the MiGs arrived. The American pilots were warned, but were too close to their bombing targets to react at once. Once free of their heavy ordnance, they were fighters again and climbed into the sky. They feared MiGs more than missiles. The resulting air battle was a masterpiece of confusion. The two aircraft would have been hard to distinguish sitting side by side on the ground. At 600 knots, in the middle of battle, the task was almost impossible and the Americans, with their greater numbers, had to hold fire until they were sure of their targets. The Russians knew what they were attacking, but they too shrank from shooting with abandon at a target that looked too much like a comrade's aircraft. The result was a swarming mix of fighters closing to a range too short for missiles, as pilots sought positive target identification, an anachronistic gun duel punctuated by surface-to-air missiles from the two surviving Russian launchers. Controllers on the American aircraft and the Russian ground station never had a chance to direct matters. It was entirely in the hands of the pilots. The fighters went to afterburner and swept into punishing high G turns while heads swiveled and eyes squinted at familiar shapes while trying to decide if the paint scheme was friendly or not. That part of the task was fairly even. The American planes were haze gray and harder to spot allowing easier target identification at long range than at short. Two Hornets died first, followed by a MiG. Then another MiG fell to cannon fire and a Hornet to a snapshot missile. An errant SAM exploded a MiG and a Hornet together. The Soviet Major saw that and screamed for the SAMs to hold fire. Then he fired his cannon at a Hornet blazing across his nose, missed and turned to follow him. He watched the American close for a high deflection shot on a MiG-29 and damage its engine. The Major didn't know how many of his aircraft were left. It was beyond that. He was engaged in a struggle for personal survival, which he expected to lose. Caution faded to nothing as he closed on afterburner and ignored his low fuel state light. His target turned north and led him over the water. The Major fired his last missile and then watched it track right into the Hornet's right engine as his own engines flamed out. The Hornet's tail fragmented and the Major screamed with delight as he and the American pilot ejected a few hundred meters apart. Four kills, the Major thought. At least I have done my duty. He was in the water 30 seconds later. Commander Davies crawled into his raft despite a broken wrist, cursing and blessing his luck at the same time. His first considered action was to activate his rescue radio. He looked around and saw another yellow raft a short distance away. It wasn't easy paddling with one arm, but the other guy was paddling toward him. What came next was quite a surprise. You are prisoner. The man was pointing a gun at him. Davies's revolver was at the bottom of the sea. Who the hell are you? I am Major Alexander Georgievich Chapayev. Soviet Air Force. 
Howdy. I'm Commander Gus Davies, U.S. Navy. Who got you? No one get me. I run out of fuel. He waved the gun. And you are my prisoner. Oh, horse shit. Major Chapayev shook his head. Like Davies, he was in a near state of shock from the stress of combat and his close escape from death. Hold on to that gun, though, Major. I don't know if there are sharks around here or not. Sharks? Davies had to think for a moment. The code name for that new Russian sub. Akula. Akula in the water. Chapayev went pale. Akula? Davies unzipped his flight suit and tucked in his injured arm. Yeah, Major. This is the third time I've had to go swimming. Last time I was on the raft for 12 hours, and I saw a couple of the goddamn things. You got any repellent on your raft? What? Chapayev was really confused now. This stuff. Davies dipped the plastic envelope in the water. Let's rope your raft to mine. Safer that way. This repellent stuff's supposed to keep the Akula away. Davies tried to secure the rafts, one-handed, and failed. Chapayev set the gun down to help. After being shot down once, then surviving an air battle, the Major was suddenly obsessed with the idea of being alive. The idea of being eaten by a carnivorous fish horrified him. He looked over the side of the raft into the water. Christ, what a morning, Davies groaned. His wrist was really hurting now. Chapayev grunted agreement. He looked around for the first time and realized he couldn't see land. Next, he reached for his rescue radio and found that his leg was lacerated. The radio pocket on his flight suit ripped away in the ejection. Aren't we two sorry sons of bitches, he said in Russian. What's that? Where is land? The sea had never looked so vast. About 25 miles that way, I think. That leg doesn't look too good, Major. Davies laughed coldly. We must have the same kind of ejector seats. Oh, shit, this arm hurts. <laughs>